you don't have to hear you don't have to hear an introduction from me for the millionth time. Instead, you'll hear it from my dear friend Deborah, who I'll have the mic to. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Global VMR. We are excited to have the girls here, Katarina and Luisa. Sejam bem-vindas. And yeah, let's rock and roll. Awesome, thank you, Deborah. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that um, this is a special GVMR with friends from all over the world. We want to uh, get to know a little bit more about our colleagues all around the world and how they practice medicine. I prepared something in Portuguese and I deleted it, but I'm gonna try either way. <laughs> uh, yeah, like Deborah helped me um, proofread it and everything and it's gone. So here goes nothing. Uh, oi gente, seja bem-vindas. Eh, estou muito animada eh, que nossos amigos tripeiros eh, estão aqui conosco no Porto. Um, falaremos de eh, um caso clínico eh, e depois um pouco da vida. Eh, isso é possível por la incrível Catarina Costa. Um, Catarina, <laughs> do you want to continue speaking Portuguese like the right way and introduce uh, yourself and your friends? Yeah, sure. Um, I will start with English. So uh, I apologize if I sound uh, congested because I am <laughs> not my friend, uh, but I'm feeling better. So hi, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me. My name is Catarina. I am an internal medicine resident from Porto in Portugal, and uh, I'm accompanied by my dear, dear friend, Luisa, who is also uh, an internal medicine resident. Um, I've been collaborating with the Super Solvers for um, a while now, and it's an absolute pleasure to be able to bring my fellow residents and uh, show this amazing platform to everyone. And I see very familiar names in the audience, so I see a lot of residents and also attendings, and I want to shout out um, a person in particular, and that's our um, um, residency coordinator, and that's Dr. Mar Margarita France, and she uh, was a big force behind this, wanting us to do this, and holding us up the entire way, so thank you to her. Uh, and now back to Portuguese. Olá a todos. Uh, os que me entendem já me conhecem, provavelmente. É incrível ter-vos aqui a todos. Uh, como já disse antes, um, um gigantesco obrigado à doutora Margarida França por nos ter uh, ajudado com este caminho. Um, e acho que isto vai ser uma sessão incrível para todos. Obrigada por terem vindo. Um, so, back to English. I'm introducing you to the person who's going to uh, present the case with me, and that is Luisa. Luisa is a third year internal medicine resident in Centro Hospitalar do Porto. Uh, she is amazing and you will uh, learn a lot from her as I have been learning a lot from her since we met um, in residency. So yeah, and she is brilliant. And she also enjoys playing the piano, which is great. Maybe someday we will uh, be able to do a duet with flute and piano. So Luisa, if you wanna say something. Hi everyone, thank you so much for uh, the invitation. Uh, your platform is really amazing and uh, I've already learned so much since Katarina introduced it to us. Uh, and I speak in, on behalf of my colleagues as well. Uh, we are all big fans of your program right now and I hope we have more uh, cases presented here. And I hope you enjoy. Muito obrigado. It's the only I, it's only Portuguese I know. And Maria, <laughs> I feel your angst. It is so um, the barrier to speak a different language is so high, which um, gives me so much admiration for um, the majority of our audience here today, who are probably equally, if not more comfortable in a different language. And um, I think the only way. Um, to break down that barrier is just to um, slowly eat at it um, and make it slower and lower and lower. Um, so for everyone who I have not had the pleasure of meeting, uh, my name is Ravi. 
I am one of the CP Solvers team members. And though um, my accent sounds uh, California smooth, as uh, Rafa likes to say, I see him here with Ravi. It is not at all California smooth. I was born in Lebanon um, and grew up in Pakistan, where I learned to speak Arabic and Hindi. But I came here in the United States a long time ago, and so um, can now pretend like I am from here. But uh, um, you can pretty uh, pretty quickly tell from my quirky food habits that I am definitely not your regular old um, consumer here. And it's a delight to be here. Um, uh, Katerina, um, the story of this is actually um, involves both Katerina and Maria. Um, Maria um, is, um, I would say, a sibling, honestly, at this point, with many years of working together. And she has a passion like no other of truly democratizing um, clinical reasoning and diagnostic reasoning. And in the journey of doing that, realizing that there's much more to democratize in the world and to to share and to uh, collaborate over and connect over than just medicine. And the birth of this series has come. And then I will never remember, never forget Katarina's uh, bursting on the clinical problem solvers um, with her presentation of a case um, on a 30 minute Thursday VMR that made it abundantly clear that she is um, a star. And, um, and it's a delight to have both of you here. And a treat, honestly, to have um, Deborah introduce the session because it's been a delight to get to know her as well. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to put a new friend on the spot, but Katarina, since you had such glowing words about your program uh, coordinator, Dr. Franza, um, I wanted to personally welcome you here and thank you for um, joining us and taking the time to be here. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if she wants to say something. Mm, just that I'm glad to be here. It's my first time. So I'm just hoping to, to learn about the program and about uh, the, um, the, the case that you are going to, to present because I, I don't know the, the, the case or I think I don't know, I don't know the case. So uh, I, I'm just glad to be here. So Thank let's you. hope we have a good session. <laughs> Thank you. It's already a great session. I uh, really okay. appreciate it. you by you being here and you all being here. It's a, it's a delight. So just to introduce everybody else to the format, I will get to know Luisa in a moment and get to know what she, in addition to duetting on the piano, enjoys outside of medicine. Um, uh, and then we'll go through one of her, through her case that has been, um, um, that has been prepared. And then um, we'll open up for a Q&A session for our audience to get to know our friends and their program and, um, and Portugal. Um, and so as, a, um, as an introduction for our new friends, what we do is uh, we um, go through a medical case together. And so I encourage all of you um, to share your thoughts in the chat and um, we'll ask individuals to share their thoughts out loud as they come through the chat. So, um, Lisa, if you want to unmute and just tell us a little bit more about how you got to medicine, why you chose to be a doctor, and how did, how did you end up where you are now? I think you're still muted, my friend. Yes, you are right. <laughs> I think it was actually a, um, an early choice in the sense that here in Portugal, and I think also in America, not sure, uh, around when we end um, junior uh, school, around age uh, 16, we have to choose whether we go to science or literature or arts. And um, well, I, I was a bit, I, I always wanted to be a doctor, but I also liked economics and journalists. So when I chose science pathway, I, I knew it was the, the right way. And so being a doctor was like the only uh, option I was really considering. Well, that's a crazy story because mine is exactly the same as yours. <laughs> I went to school in Pakistan where you also had to make a similar choice. You were either in the S section of science or L section for literature. And oh my God, I can I can barely understand English now. So it was a very e easy choice for me to choose science, and, and here I am. 
And how, when did you first meet Katerina? Uh, I met her, uh, I would say, on my second day of work in Centro Hospitalar do Porto, which is our hospital. We, it is in Porto, downtown, and we were located to the same um, uh, awards. Yeah. And so she was there. She was like she was a second year resident, but already looking like a fifth uh, year <laughs> resident. Very confident, very <laughs> yeah, helping us out. And how did your English become so good? What was the path to? Oh, thank you. Uh, I was. It's actually very rusty, especially um, technique English. So. Yeah. Sorry if I mess it, mess it up a bit. Uh, I, I was, I did um, uh, certificates in advanced English while I was in high school and I think it helped a lot. Wow, it, clearly. By the way, you know how I know your English is great is when you're trying to apologize, you use a fancy word like rusty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for that intro, and we'll get to know you a lot better after uh, as we go through the case. So um, we'll transition to the case and share our screen and encourage everybody to share their thoughts in the chat, and we'll go through this journey together. Okay, we can start with the case. I'm going to open up the festivities, and then Louise is going to take over, and we will, um, you know, interchange the aliquots between us. So here we go. Let's not lose any more time. So um, this is a case of a 25-year-old female whose chief complaints are polyarthralgias and generalized edema. And let's, ju let's jump straight into the HPI. So this patient uh, presented with a two-month history of bilateral uh, symmetrical arthralgias in the metacarpophalangeal and knee joints with inflammatory rhythm and morning stiffness lasting around one hour. And additionally, around the same time, she developed enlarged cervical nodes and facial and lower limb edema. She also endorsed asthenia, which had been gradually increasing since the symptoms began. And so she presented to the emergency department of an outside hospital due to worsening of her symptoms, and she was admitted for study of this syndrome. And we will pause here. Oh my gosh, what a start. It's like accelerating right through the gates. Um, so folks, there's probably three or four themes here. The first theme is the polyarthralgia. The other theme is the edema. And then there's a cervical lymphadenopathy. So um, maybe we can explore the polyarthralgia. So Dhruv, um, I see that you're sharing some thoughts. Do you want to unmute and tell us what you're thinking? Ah, it's been a while since I've been able to be on. Hi, guys. Um, so the typical um, like board exam answer when you see something like morning stiffness of the MCP uh, joints in particular is, um, oh, uh, uh, bon dia, uh, I guess. Hello. Um, uh, when you when you typically see morning stiffness uh, of MCP knee joints, ankle joints, uh, whatnot, is rheumatoid arthritis. But the cervical nodes and edema are starting to make me be very worried. Um, usually, you do not see those. Yeah, I'm thinking more of something like a. Uh, some sort of vasculitic process, something like SLE or um, anything that would be attacking the kidneys in particular. I think that's superb, my friend. Um, intern year is doing you clearly very well. Um, Rodrigue, are you uh, in a place where you can unmute and tell us more about what you were thinking? No worries if you can't. I'm gonna assume not, but that's okay. If you uh, if you are able to, just unmute. And no problem at all, my friend. No problem at all. Um, I'm curious what what you folks are thinking about the edema. Where does that land you? Drew 
shared a thought about, uh, about the kidneys. Hans, do you want to share your thought? Yes, I mean, when Drew was talking and I mean, my first thought was um, rheumatoid arthritis as well, but then it was already mentioned in the rounds that the edema could be related to the kidneys, which then of course could make us think about SLE as an option as well, but it doesn't yet completely fit our picture. There's a little bit more. Beautiful. And where are you these days, Hans? Are you in Canada or in Germany or where are you? I'm still in Germany, but I'm, I'm returning back to Canada in yeah, the beginning of May. But okay. right now they're having one heavy gale force storm after another oh, in this gosh. area. Gosh, oh my gosh. Okay, well, stay safe, okay? Yeah, it's, it's worse in the north than in England. Is it? I heard that they couldn't land their planes in Heathrow today, so I'm not too surprised. Um, Ravi is sharing some wonderful thoughts. I see Ravi and Rafa are together. Hello. Uh, hey, how are you? We miss you guys. Yeah, we, we miss you too. Yeah. How are you doing? Dr. Medina, we, um, this place is... <laughs> Literally, the Rafa, when you move, just so you know, when you move, the camera follows you, so you can't Yeah, hide. that's a problem. <laughs> uh, really so uh, what were you all thinking with RA? Uh, we, we were sort of talking amongst each other. You know, the lupus, uh, Hans mentioned lupus, but uh, mixed connective tissue disease, you could get maybe some RA, which could explain some of that morning stiffness, because I don't think morning stiffness has a lot to do with lupus. But, you know, with the lymphadenopathy, um, that that brings into play possibly. And also the epidemiology as well, 25 years old. Yeah. Uh, that definitely brings uh, lupus in, yeah. maybe with that, yeah, with that rheumatoid arthritis component as well. Superb. I couldn't agree more. Um, and our, my friend Gitu is um, reflecting on RA and the complications of RA. Gitu, do you, are you able to unmute and share those thoughts? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think the uh, I agree with the suggestion of RA with the morning stiffness lasting one hour and also the particular joints involved, the metacarpophalangeal joint, and as well as the age and the gender of the patient. In terms of how to put the edema, uh, I would think it's more consistent. It could be the hypoalbuminic state, such as nephrotic syndrome. And then how does RA um, relates to nephrotic syndrome is, it could be the uh, A amyloidosis, which is about 40% of patients with A amyloidosis do have a RA as a chronic inflammatory process. One thing that I can't really um, piece together here is the lymph nodes. I'm not sure. I know the uh, RA could lead to certain malignancy lymphoma, Lymphoma by itself can actually cause nephrotic syndromes as well, AL amyloidosis. So my thought is RA, which yeah. could be complicated by nephrotic syndrome, either in the form of A amyloidosis or AL amyloidosis, but I would go with A than AL. Oh my gosh, your thoughts are absolutely superb on par with um, clinical excellence, really. Um, Okay. Am I pronouncing your, can, can you tell me how, uh, how to pronounce your name correctly? I don't want to get it wrong in the future. Gaitu Teres. Gaitu. Yeah. And, and where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Long Island, New York. Wonderful. And, uh, awesome. Hospital cool. Perfect. 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 Um, my friend Jorge is mentioning a subset of RA called Felty syndrome. Jorge, are you in a place where you can unmute? Maybe, maybe not. Let's see. Oh, library. Oh, my gosh. We have so many library people on VMR, which the overlap makes a ton of sense. Um, AMK, are you in the library? I'm not. I'm at work. Uh, thank you for, um, for hanging out despite being at work. You want to tell us you're, uh, you're putting the brakes, I think, very appropriately on autoimmune disease and expanding our horizons. You want to share your thoughts out loud? 
Yeah, I was just thinking in um, a young patient, I always want to be thinking about infections and and there's obviously overlap too, like an infection could lead to a glomerular nephritis or something like that. So I just want to make sure that I'm thinking about things like HIV, especially with the cervical lymphadenopathy, thinking about STIs, um, syphilis, um, gonorrhea can all have joint manifestations. I don't think that there's one necessarily that I think is a perfect fit here, but I just want to make sure that that was evaluated um, kind of while also considering autoimmune diseases and also the overlap between infection and autoimmune diseases. That's absolutely superb. I couldn't agree more with you. Um, and I think that, um, you know, you could, it's, it's hard to know where to begin in this case, but I think if you saw this patient in front of you, you would probably be most struck by the edema. And I think the edema mandates an explanation, especially when it involves the face. And you don't need to think too hard initially beyond the three organs, the heart, the, uh, the liver, and um, the kidneys. And when edema is predominant without much associated shortness of breath or jaundice, it's probably the kidney. So think about that. If your patient just comes to you with edema all the way up to their face and hasn't mentioned the, the, the presence of shortness of breath, is it heart failure? Sure, but is it likely heart failure? Probably not. If your patient is so edematous that their face is swollen from liver disease, you better see evidence of that in the form of jaundice in their eyes. So the pretest probability of this, if this is a systemic cause of edema being renal is pretty high based on that. And then when you layer in the, arth the polyarthralgias, that's even more support to the kidney. Why? Let's just keep it simple. When somebody says their joint hurts, joint, one joint, it's probably not the joint itself. So if I tell you I have elbow pain, it's more likely to be olecranon bursitis than intraarticular disease. My shoulder hurts, it's probably rotator cuff disease. If my knee hurts, it's probably pre bursitis. But as soon as multiple joints start to hurt at the same time, the DDX is very narrow. And the DDX is viral arthritis like parvo, endocarditis, disseminated gonococcal infection as we learned last week, and then autoimmune disease. That autoimmune disease could be crystalline in nature like gout or pseudogout, but more likely in people who are young to be pure autoimmune disease. So why is the kidney more likely? How many autoimmune diseases can you think of that affect the heart and the liver compared to the kidney? Both the kidney and the joints are a hotbed for autoimmune activity. And so the flavor of autoimmunity here is very, very likely, but as Anne-Marie said, has to be tempered by two facts. One, infection looms large. You can't give anybody immunosuppression without making sure that in infections aren't playing. And there's a tension. And that tension is that lymphadenopathy is rarely autoimmune. There's about eight or nine diagnoses that present with lymphadenopathy as autoimmune diseases with lupus, still, sarcoid, Kukuchi, uh, Brozai, Dorfman, and things of that nature. But they're rare compared to infections and malignancies. So here, I think the trifecta of infection autoimmune malignancies at play, but the impetus when there's joints and kidneys is renal disease. But I would live closely to Anne-Marie's words. Um, we, just because an autoimmune disease is likely does not mean that your pathway to that diagnosis has to take pit stops in infection. And so the focus should be on infection, but I think our antennae up is for autoimmune disease. All righty, Dream Team, we'll give the mic back to our friends, Louisa and Katarina. All right, so moving on to past medical history, the patient had two, had been diagnosed twice in the previous year with acute pyelonephritis. Uh, the first episode was about a year ago and the second one, uh, six months before uh, presentation. And in both episodes, she was treated with empirical antibiotics. And ever since the second episode, episode of UTI, she was under postcoital nitrofurantoin. Uh, she was also medicated with uh, oral contraceptive. And uh, it, that was it regarding medication. 
Moving on to family history, she had uh, four maternal uncles and one maternal cousin diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. And both her parents uh, had been diagnosed with arterial hypertension in their 50s. She worked as a digital content publisher. She worked remote. She lived with her parents in an apartment, in an urban area uh, with good sanitation. She had no contact with animals. Um, and no recent travels abroad, abroad or in, in Portugal. Uh, she reported occasional uh, alcohol and smoked uh, cannabinoids consumption. She had no allergies. Oh, beautiful. Did you say rusty? I don't believe you. A really <laughs> excellent, clear job. I will take this aliquot because I know there are um, some more to come our way and just reflect briefly with you and, um, and then invite the audience to participate next time. Um, whenever uh, pyelonephritis is a very plausible diagnosis um, in a young woman, but you always have to step back. And whenever the future of a patient is uncertain, you always have to revisit what anchors you've been anchoring on. And so does she have pyelonephritis or another mimic of flank pain? Um, so for example, you might say, what causes flank pain that becomes relevant in the world of edema later? And a simple answer could be that she has kidney stones as a clue to a systemic condition like hypercalcemia, or more rarely that she has glomerular bleeding enough to cause pain, which is rare, but well described in what's called loin pain hematuria syndrome, or more morbid of all, she has nephrotic syndrome and has renal vein thrombosis presenting as flank pain. Um, more alarming in a case that has an autoimmune flavor is the nitrofurantoin. So nitrofurantoin is the first ever um, medical topic that I dove into as a third year medical student on the wards, little baby medical student. I remember um, uh, feeling so overwhelmed with a case. And I was, it was appropriate to be overwhelmed with a case because it was a case of nitrofurantoin induced autoimmune hepatitis. We published the case report, my first ever one. And in that review, I learned of the devastating possibilities related to autoimmune disease from nitrofurantoin. The most common um, are lung manifestations, but a variety of hematological manifestations are also described. So here we'll have to step back and say, is this primary autoimmune disease? If it becomes autoimmune disease, or is this drug-induced disease? Um, but we can only do that once we're confident that this is autoimmune in nature. And so we'll leave that as a thread to explore later. Um, and then everything else that was mentioned, I think is helpful, but only helpful once we clarify the foreground. So I'll pass the mic back to our friends to get more of that foreground so we can revisit this aliquot and see if it's helpful later. Okay, so on the emergency room, uh, patients appeared well, no signs of discomfort, uh, vital signs. Uh, BP was uh, 160, uh, 120. Her heart rate was 90 uh, per minute, respiratory rate 16 cycles per minute, temperature was 77 degrees, her uh, oxygen saturation was 100% on room air. She had palpable and facial edema. Her pulse was regular and rhythm. Uh, she had no murmurs to cardiac auscultation. Lungs were clear. The uh, abdomen was uh, soft, non-tender to palpation. She had no organomegaly. Um, and her skin uh, was, showed no abnormalities, no rash. 
she had the symmetrical pitting edema of the lower limbs up to the knees. And she also had uh, palpable mobile painless uh, nodes around one centimeter and they were palpable uh, in the cervical, uh, axillary and inguinal areas bilaterally. She had no articular deformities, no inflammatory signs, including no, earth, no arthritis or synovitis. A neurological exam was normal. Oh, isn't this exam incredibly helpful? Thank you, Lisa. It really, really helped us clarify um, the nature of what's going on. What happens to people with edema from heart failure? To their, what happens to the blood pressure of people who develop edema from heart failure? Low. What happens to the average blood pressure in a patient with liver disease? Low. Whenever you see edema and hypertension, your priority should be kidney disease. But it's probably more common that your patient has amlodipine and causing lower extremity edema, so don't get too excited too quickly. The overlap also includes less common things like Cushing syndrome, which can also cause edema uh, and hypertension. But what I will do is I'm going to mute my mic for 30 seconds and get the collective wisdom of the chat to see what they think, and we'll reconvene. So I'll mute for 30 seconds. Please get all your thoughts in the chat as to what you think is going on, and we'll meet in 30 seconds. Yes, Maria, the suspense, like no other. Montaz, my friend, how are you? Do you want to share your thought about TV? Yes, good evening. How are you? It's so nice uh, to see you. Th thank you very much for having me and giving me such opportunity. I am uh, very excited to share in this, uh, in this case today, but uh, but I, I am having a suggestion regarding the uh, availability of lymphadenopathy, survivor lymphadenopathy, with polyarthralgia. Maybe some some uh, TB or uh, uh, tubular interstitial disease with uh, TB. Maybe uh, during if there is urban urban area uh, and uh, some some uh, raw milk ingestion in such instance that maybe having uh, a clue to some uh, tuberculosis uh, infection. I don't know. That's only my suggestion. Motaz, I think that is a superb suggestion, reminding us to think about the global prevalence of TB being um, almost a third of the population having latent TB at risk. And you're identifying two key features of tuberculosis, which is um, the presence of cervical lymphadenopathy and polyarthritis. As a review, the most common articular manifestation of tuberculosis is POTS disease or, or thoracic spinal disease, which, but um, there are um, manifestations in the peripheral skeleton as well, including dactylitis and what's called Ponset's disease, which is a disease of symmetric RA-like arthritis. So this is, um, this would be a great, great case. Um, Anne-Marie, do you want to share your um, sense of um, the labs and how they might be helpful? Where does that instinct come from? Yeah, I think in a case like this where there's an inflammatory signature and maybe pointing us to the kidneys, getting more objective data can really help guide next steps. So a lot of times um, starting out with looking at the creatinine, um, seeing if you have a prior baseline to compare it to, um, 
to look for signs of AKI and then looking at the urinalysis, which will usually show you if there's albumin loss in the urine or proteinuria, which could point to a glomerular process and could kind of help guide next steps going forward. And then also the CBC counts, do we see pancytopenia or certain cell counts down, which could also point to either an autoimmune disease like lupus, a malignancy or HIV or another systemic uh, process. Oh, so good. I couldn't agree more. Katarina and Luisa, the people are demanding the labs already, whatever you are. Okay, there we go. So maybe AMK saw into the future because this young woman had a white blood cell count of 2.1, lymphocytes 0 0.9, her hemoglobin was 6.6, .6, and her platelets were 27,000. Her reticulocyte index was 0 0.46, her LDH was 497, and her haptoglobin was below the threshold of detection of the lab. She had a positive direct antiglobulin test and her peripheral, peripheral blood smear showed stacks of red blood cells only. Her creatinine was 1.63, her BUN was 38, her sodium, potassium chloride and calcium were normal. Her total bilirubin was 4.3 and her direct bilirubin was 0.72. Her CRP was 6, ESR 80, and her UA showed uh, hematuria and proteinuria. And she also had a CT of the whole body, which showed uh, diffuse uh, lymphadenopathy and small volume ascites and bilateral pleural effusion. And we will stop here because it's a lot of information. Yo, oh, there's an answer now, I believe. I think this case now becomes a working diagnosis of blank. And hopefully you prove it, but if not, you're ready to know what you missed. So since it's, we're 40 minutes, I will keep, the, keep an eye out on the chat, but let me try to convince you why you should have a working diagnosis of blank. All right, let's fill in the blank. So the most striking abnormality here is pancytopenia. And as you all mentioned, there's three mechanisms of pancytopenia, increased loss of all cells, impaired synthesis in the bone marrow, or a complete takeover of the bone marrow by infiltration with something else like a metastatic cancer, okay? So there's cells are lost in the periphery, the bone marrow isn't working or the bone marrow is taken hostage by something. Now, before we go into detail, our dear friends have answered the question. What else causes pancytopenia with a low haptoglobin, indirect hyperbilirubinemia and a direct antiglobulin test? The very thorough workup done by our friends here proves that there is more loss. There's high loss pancytopenia here because you have evidence of hemolysis. So then the question becomes, what are the causes of high loss pancytopenia? I'll quote Maria, continue the suspense. Oh. Does this patient have a tick-borne disease uh, with normal liver enzymes, no prominent fever? Probably not. Does this patient have malignancy? You have to worry about it, but she doesn't have any lymphocytes on her, lymphocytosis. And these are possible, but much less likely. And we saw the PAN scan. She doesn't have splenomegaly. The most notorious cause of pancytopenia with evidence of increased loss is lupus. And the diagnosis that you all mentioned very early in a patient with polyarthritis and facial edema. So I would encourage you not to get too confident here and say, this is lupus, but this is the whole thing that we're trying to do about working diagnosis. 
So here's where I'm at. This case is lupus or lupus mimickers. Okay. So you should have a schema or an organized list of what mimics lupus. And the biggest mimickers are drug-induced causes, which goes back to the hypothesis that y'all were mentioning. So in this patient, I would get a rapid uh, rheumatology consult, consider um, uh, rapidly giving her steroids because her kidneys are compromised. And by the way, the only real overlap of kidney dysfunction and pancytopenia is lupus. Not many other diseases do that. Um, so this train is moving quickly towards lupus. And as Hans is suggesting, there are some clues that you can collect about drug-induced causes with the serology. It would be a bias to call this lupus and only lupus pending the ANA and the subserologies. Um, but the key learning here is pancytopenia, you can prove it to be destructive in nature by seeing evidence of hemolysis. And there's only three causes of destructive pancytopenia, tick-borne infections, lupus, and some rare malignancies. Alrighty, friends, I'll pass the mic back to you. All right, so uh, going to rheumatology workup, uh, the patient had low C3 and C4. C3 was about 30 milligrams per deciliter. C4 was uh, 0 0.7 milligrams per deciliter. She had positive uh, anus in a nuclear homogeneous uh, pattern, AC1. She had high anti-DS DNA uh, antibodies. She had also positive antihistone and antinucleosome antibodies. Upon these results, uh, a diagnosis of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus was made. Um, and here is where I would like to share uh, the screen to show you the, evolu the evolution of our patients. So uh, the patient was started on steroids. She was started on prednisolone. However, the response was not as, expect as expected and immunosuppression was gradually escalated to uh, intravenous immunoglobulin, mycophenolite, uh, moftil, and prophylactic cotrimoxazole, of course. And then she was also um, given um, rituximab. She completed two administrations. And at last, hydroxychloroquine was also started. However, um, her pancytopenia did not evolve as expected. As we can see, um, leukopenia and uh, thrombocytopenia uh, gradually improved. However, uh, anemia did not improve as uh, expected. She needed uh, three uh, blood transfusions and um, hemoglobin uh, did not increase uh, as we were hoping. Uh, Regarding her renal function, we noticed that after the second administration of rituximab, it's improved and, um, and uh, on the 5th of August, about a year after, uh, about a, a month after uh, her admission, uh, it was still improving. Nevertheless, she, she maintained her anemia in very low values of hemoglobin. And because of this, she, uh, a diagnosis of anemia refractory to immunosuppression was made and she was transferred to our hospital considering the need of possible plasmapheresis. Oy, oy, oy. Um, this is such a mesmerizing case, and unfortunately, my time management skills were suboptimal because I rambled and rambled before. So this is good, though, because this makes you practice thinking hard clinical reasoning fast. 
So this case I think is out absolutely outstanding and a case I've never heard or seen before, where you have a very good diagnosis of anti-double-stranded DNA positive lupus, but the patient's sort of getting better. Some things are getting better, the kidney function, but other things are not. And so that's what I was alluding to before is you have to try to have a list, which hopefully will even refine even more of lupus and lupus mimickers. The first caveat is you need an expert to tell you, can lupus do this in severe refractory forms? And the answer is probably to some degree, but that's a diagnosis of exclusion. So the question is, how can lupus be so complicated? And of course, we talked about the possibility of drug-induced disease. And I would stop the nitrofurantoin here, even if there wasn't much literature behind it, because that is a hypothesis that only provable once the patient um, tests that. But the truth is, there's one notorious mimicker of lupus, and that is a case we've actually heard on VMR before um, by Anne-Marie's colleague, Mitu, who presented a case of angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma, which is a disorder that usually affects older adults and causes a positive ANA, it looks just like lupus. But the truth is lupus is not um, a diagnosis that can travel by itself. It has so many associations. And in this particular case, what is very striking is the hematological pr predominance of the disease. So let me share with you one schema about the hematological manifestations of lupus. Um, and that is that you can have many things to complicate lupus and heme. You can have thrombosis, you can have bleeding, and you can have refractory cytopenias. And so the question here is, does this patient have these additional uh, associations with lupus? Does she have APLS? Does she have uh, throm TTP? Both are possible. Does she have autoimmune myelofibrosis? I would entertain the diagnosis of autoimmune myelofibrosis here, primarily because her reticulocytes were low. Do you remember her reticulocyte index? It was, should have been higher, but it wasn't. It was low. So I think this case is a great example that lupus can be mimicked by things like angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma, can be induced by drugs, but drug-induced lupus is usually not so severe. So the most important lesson is lupus comes attached with many other diagnoses, most commonly APLS. But as you can see, look at this list. So many things come attached to lupus. What would I look for in this specific patient? I think you have to look for TTP because the patient still has refractory anemia, thrombocytopenia, and is very morbid. But the direct antiglobulin makes it less likely. You have to look for APLS because it also causes a refractory pancytopenia needing plasmapheresis. And also, in this instance, you might have the rare scenario of lupus attacking the bone marrow itself, causing autoimmune myelofibrosis. So those are the things that I'd be looking about. The most morbid possibility is this person has slowly progressive hemophagocytic syndrome from lupus, which is also possible. Alrighty, I'll give the mic back to you guys. Okay, so let's speed this up. So on arrival to our hospital, her hemoglobin was 6.2, uh, but she had no thrombocytopenia, her leukocytes were normal, her haptoglobin was also normal, and there were uh, new, no new changes in her peripheral blood smear. Her uh, ESR and CRP were much lower than the presentation. Her uh, iron profile showed normal iron, low transferrin, and a saturation of 49% with a ferritin of 1600. And her uh, LDH was around 300. No other new changes. Uh, her B12 and folic acid were normal, but this time her direct antiglobulin test was negative, which was, and it was positive in the, at the beginning. So uh, her uh, TSH and free T4 were normal. A lot of serologies were sent and they were all negative, including HIV, syphilis, EBV, rubella, CMV, HSV, VZV, and parvovirus. And she also had a bone marrow studies done, which showed hy a hypocellular bo bone marrow with no defects in maturation or morphologic changes of all cell lines and the flow cytometry of peripheral blood and bone marrow, blood, um, blood and bone marrow, sorry, were also normal. So after all this, 
uh, a light bulb moment happened and the next aliquot will reveal the final diagnosis. <laughs> There's no light in here, y'all. Um, okay, no. let me clarify one thing. Um, actually, it would be helpful, Katarina. I'll, um, do you mind to get us all on the same page? Because there's, um, this is to both of you, there's a lot of information here. Can you summarize what the problem is? Like if you had to say, what is the real problem now? What would you say your problem representation is for all of us so that we can be on the same page? So we have a young patient with um, diagnosis of lupus. Uh, there's no doubt, doubt about it. And she has been on immunosuppression for a while. Everything has improved except for her anemia. Beautiful. So is it fair to say that we have isolated anemia in a patient with lupus who has no obvious offending medications, no nutritional deficiencies like iron or B12, Fair? We, we, I think we checked all those. Iron, B12. Okay. Yes. Here, let me show you what I'd be thinking about. I'll just show it to you because I think, um, I think we should do this. One thing. Maria's going to kill me because we're so late. But, <laughs> oh my God, are you listening to this case? <laughs> all right. So we have chronic isolated anemia in a patient with lupus. So let's use our clues of lupus, right? You told us her iron studies are low, are normal, excuse me. And you told us that um, she, her haptoglobin, her hemolysis parameters have normalized. I think the key thing is not to miss something relatively simple like B12 deficiency. Has she not been eating well? You could also think about her kidney now being worse and contributing to her anemia, but you ruled that out. She has no obvious toxins or meds that I know. So this part is really standing out to me. And the question is, which one of these is associated with autoimmune disease? And that's pure red cell aplasia. So I would be, in this case, I'm a little surprised that her flow cytometry is normal because in patients with pure red cell aplasia, they have a low number of CD34 cells or stem cells. So I would specifically ask that question. But whenever you're like, oh, this patient is anemic and I've done my workup and I haven't found the answer, usually it's because of this set of things. So I think the question is, does this patient have MDS? Less likely because the bone marrow findings are usually more obvious in MDS. So you might be dealing with pure red cell aplasia, but there's a discrepancy here. The discrepancy is that you usually see a reduction in the erythroid line, and you see usually a reduction in CD4, uh, uh, CD4 positive uh, cells in the bone marrow. So the honest answer is I don't know, and I cannot wait to learn from you and um, grow our collective knowledge about, about lupus. I'm gonna see if there are any, um, I would just actually, uh, just for the sake of time, keep the thoughts pouring in the chat and, um, we will pass the mic to our friends to learn from them. Louisa, you are muted. Sorry, guys. Uh, so I was saying, uh, Rabbi, um, as you mentioned, drugs uh, were uh, a good clue to start. So we took it from there. Um, and actually what we noticed is that she had several drugs that could uh, cause um, bone marrow toxicity and contribute to anemia. And we started from there. So we stopped um, hydrox hydroxychloroquine. We stopped cotrimoxazole. And we stopped uh, MMF. And what we noticed was that the um, uh, hemoglobin values anemia was gradually resolving. And from what we read, uh, hydroxychloroquine was less likely 
so we we reintroduced it and we discharged the patient because anemia resolved uh, i would like to mention that we of course uh, we stopped cotrimoxazole but we started a tovacrone as a substitute and uh, we later on stopped um uh, sorry, we later on reintroduced MMEF, so we were left with cotrimoxazole as being the cause of this refractory anemia. Oh my gosh, what a great, great way to solve a very complicated problem. Um, I am in awe of this case. I think um, uh, cotrimoxazole um, uh, Oh, you're thinking of, uh, I may have misheard. Are you thinking of clotrimazole or a uh, trimethoprim? Bactrim. Back yeah, Bactrim. Gotcha. <laughs> um, any, any disease, any um, uh, agent with a sulfa moiety like this medication um, can certainly do this. I'm humbled by it. Um, it's also a great reminder of when things happen to people under your watch, it's probably something we did to them. Uh, and so your emphasis on the medications is amazing. For the sake of time, I'll pass the mic to you guys to share what you learned and what reflections and what your experience was in this case. Um, I wasn't directly involved um, with the case. Uh, the case was Louise's. I'm just here to give a helping hand, but this was presented in our grand rounds. So I've had uh, a, a while to think about this case. And, you know, I think I've said this before on VMR um, that one of my professors once said that many times uh, our patients survive not because of what we do, but in spite of what we do. So we uh, always have to think about um, possible toxicity of what we are doing. And this lady was under some heavy, heavy immunosuppression medication. And if everything is going well, except for one thing, probably the problem is on our side. So I think that was the biggest um, light bulb moment that, we, that, that was had. And also to look at the bone marrow and not be too focused on the hemolysis part of this problem. Uh, yeah, because she had a low reticulocyte index from the start, and that was probably because of the inflammation and everything. Uh, but maybe we should have looked at the bone marrow sooner, and that was where the problem was. So yeah, I don't know if Louisa has something to add. Brilliant. Louisa, tell us more. Um, this was, of course, uh, the credit uh, goes uh, to our... Um, attendings that we, uh, from the, the moment the patient was transferred, the attendings in the team, and I like to say Dr. Rita Diaz and Professor Marino, they all uh, had this impression that something was off and it could be um, uh, drug-induced uh, toxicity because everything improved in this lupus, uh, kidney function, um, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, uh, patients' complaints. So it had to be something that we were doing and it was not uh, drugs related to immunosuppression, something else. And it was really a pleasure to, to see the patient getting, back, getting better because since she was transferred with the diagnosis of hemolytic uh, anemia, our blood, we, she was only getting blood transfusions when very necessary, of course. So she was living on a five hemoglobin level for two months. And then when, we, when she, she, she got to our hospital and she started uh, improving like in a two days, I remember she came in on a Friday and then we stopped the back train and on Monday, her hemoglobin was already improving. Coombs was now negative. So we uh, got her a uh, blood transfusion and she was so, so happy and seeing, it, seeing that was very nice. Um, I've had the, uh, the, the pleasure um, 
of doing this. Um, you know what, what just happened right now is I think Maria just spotlighted my video and I'm so, oh, did you? And I'm seeing myself, so it's so weird. <laughs> but thank you for doing that, Maria. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure, I think we've been doing Global VMR for um, a year and a half now. And um, I don't know if I've ever been this humbled, honestly. And I think it's a little bit overwhelming now sitting here and reflecting on what just happened where there's people literally from all over the world um, reflecting and dissecting um, an absolutely mesmerizing case. And it's mesmerizing in multiple ways. Um, the case is inherently very interesting and intriguing. Um, um, but most inspiring of all is how you've packaged such a complicated story and delivered so much to us today. I mean, uh, Louisa, I cannot tell you how um, inspired I am to see how healthy medicine is across the world you and your team and your attendings and everybody who thought about this patient are literally the definition of what I think genius is, is to have so much hard work and dedication into your craft to be able to sniff out from under lupus, the, the sneaky effect of a medication we give like candy to everybody. And the amount of hard work and dedication it requires to suspect that, diagnose that, and make a patient better is amazing. And I wouldn't be surprised if this patient was less lucky, didn't meet you and your team, and got stuck with transfusions for a long time. But I'm also in awe of your ability to tell the story in a completely different language, to do it so calmly, collectively, with a smile on your face. And, and I think I'm in awe of the community that's here. There's 40 people here alive and many more who listen to this afterwards, who are all taking the time on a Saturday to come and join us in this journey. Um, I have to, I'm already late to go see my own patients, which hopefully is not a reflection on my character as a doctor, but I can't leave now. I mean, I, I'm just so in awe of you. I hope um, a fraction of you are as inspired as I am. I know um, we have members from your university who are here listening, and I hope um, that you are inspired to join us. And really, this is ultimately um, a little bit selfish. It's for us to celebrate the thing we enjoy about medicine um, and to learn as we did today, but ultimately also for our patients. And I think there's no better way, there's no better case that illustrates how crucial it is that we all get together across the world and do this all the time for free. Because how much, is this the only patient who's going to have lupus and get started on Bactrim? No. And I bet you the chances of the 40 people who are here today diagnose it just went through the roof and everybody else is behind. So I'm in awe of you both. I'm very, very grateful for you coming. And um, I will get off my spotlight now and give the mic to Maria um, to uh, reflect with you and to um, get to know you better as people in your program. Thank you, Robbie. Um... Yeah, if Luisa and Catarina are up for it, I know there's a couple of uh, the residents. Uh, there's Inés, Marley, Nuno, Rute, Filipa, Antonio, Ana, Catarina, Castello, Diana. Uh, and we would love to get to know you a little bit more as people uh, because that is basically, you know, that's who we are. You know, we are doctors, yes, but we're also human beings. And that just makes us better doctors to get to know each other. Uh, so Luisa, I have to start with you and I have to start with our first question that we do to everybody. Okay. If we go to Porto, what should we eat? Oh, that's easy. <laughs> Francesina, of course, it's a sandwich um, made of, you. of course, you have bread first and then steak and some ham and uh, sausages. It's very, very nice. But yeah, you yeah, forgot yeah. the beer sauce that it has. On yes, the spicy sauce. Oh, Very nice. <laughs> Maria has heard about the sandwich many, many times from me. <laughs> Love it. How do you call yeah. those little, um, those little sweet stuff that are so good? Uh, Pastéis nata. 
Yeah, but there's a lot of other stuff. Portuguese are great at cooking. Uh, so we have pretty and much anything also. you want. <laughs> Lots of fresh fish, which is great, grilled. And Porto is right near the river and the sea. So it's a great place to eat fresh fish. Uh, and a lot of other stuff, you know, like cozida portuguesa, which is like this boiled amount of meat and smoked sausage and vegetables and potatoes, which is amazing. And lots of other things. So uh, we, we can't really make a list because it's so many things. But please come. We will show you. We will, we will go with you <laughs> to the restaurants and we will show you everything. <laughs> we will definitely go back. I have to be honest and tell everybody that Porto is my favorite city in the whole wide world so mm. far. There's nobody who's beat that. So I'm definitely going back. And I was wondering, uh, Catarina, because I know that you're very close to the sea and uh, I know that there's a lot of like ID enthusiasts that get excited with like I like sea related infections. Do you get to see a lot of those or is it just textbook stuff that doesn't really happen? <laughs> um, we honestly, we have a really great ID department and they take care of a lot of that stuff. I, uh, I, I spent some time there on an elective um, last year. We don't really see a lot of that because the fishing towns are, uh, are not exactly in Porto, are a little bit farther away. So I guess uh, there you can see other things, but no, we, we don't really see a lot of that. Um, there's a lot of HIV. Um, a, a lot of tick-borne diseases also because we receive a lot of patients from the north of the of the country where there are the, there's still a lot of agriculture um, so a lot of tick-borne diseases a lot of fungal diseases as well so yeah uh, ideas it's it's interesting in Portugal and it's very different from from the United States even in tick-borne diseases we don't have the same things so yeah it's it's very interesting that was super interesting. Uh, I, I could never do ID because I get too scared and I like life. <laughs> so I, 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 I try to like not pay attention to, uh, you know, I infections uh, related to things I love, but that is uh, super cool how you mentioned a little bit about the geography of the infections. And I wanted to ask, uh, Katarina, you can, um, plug this to anyone from your program, but is there any specific uh, project that your program has going on that you are particularly proud of that you would like to uh, show the world? I think uh, our friend Nunu can take that one, if he wants to. Nunu, welcome. Hello, hello there. Uh, I didn't get the question, I'm sorry. You are referring about projects on our department? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think in the last uh, year or two, uh, we got to do some podcasts uh, with teams we all uh, we all uh, find uh, important to our um, to our uh, academic uh, uh, and to our knowledge as as doctors and to to and that that can really uh, it's. So it's the initiative. It was like um, uh, every every resident showed uh, uh, shows the team, and then uh, some. Uh, we we always had an attending with us uh, supervising the, the 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 program and the the, um, the podcast, and we shows we shows we uh, residents shows another attending that was uh, keen on that team, and that it was. Um, and we get to talk to them uh, for a while, like 15 minutes and, uh, and uh, um, with some questions that we found, we found uh, to be relevant uh, on that matter. And they answered us and it was very, very interesting when, and we all learned uh, from others uh, some questions uh, like, it, that that can seem uh, uh, very very easy uh, for us, and can seem easy. The 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 slow the um, the little things uh, on those on those questions, uh, the details uh, that matter. That Sorry, is my my English my English is a little bit rusty too. <laughs> no, no rusty at all. That is 
I just, awesome. That is incredible. I just I'm have not... to think, think a lot. <laughs> it's okay. You can also talk in Portuguese if you prefer that. And that is incredible. We're super podcast people here. I'm so happy somebody put that in the chat. I'll definitely I, check that out. I, th yeah. I think we we can send you the links from the podcasts that we, yeah. we made. Somebody just put it in the chat. And they are in Portuguese. They, they are not in English. It's okay. Like I I am like burning a lot of like, like podcasts because I'm traveling like 50 kilometers a couple of times a week. And so I needed more podcasts and I needed specifically Portuguese podcasts. And that is awesome. It's, I'm going to be like your biggest fan, Nuno. <laughs> <laughs> um, congratulations on this big initiative. I think... Uh, you know, podcasts are really changing also a lot of the medical education in the world because you uh, as a resident in Portugal can share all of this knowledge uh, through podcasts with everybody here. So that is awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, we'll definitely check that out. Sukriti had a very interesting question. Sukriti, do you want to open your mic and um, ask it to the our Tripeiros friends? Sure. Hi, Maria. Hi, Ravi. Hi, Luisa, Katerina. That was such an amazing case. Um, really enjoyed learning for you. My question for all of you was, um, what has been your most memorable patient encounter? Um, I think we all uh, have many, many stories to tell. That is the nature of internal medicine. But I think we can have someone else tell a story. Um, I think... Uh, Ana Monteiro, and Natasha Iana. I don't know if she's still here. Probably not. She, maybe she left. Uh, but I think, uh, ah, no, Stali, Stali. <laughs> I think she's too shy. Anna, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am here, but I'm being put on the spot right now. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I can't remember. Ah, I'm being put on the spot. I can't remember anything right now. Ah, I can't remember your stories, though. <laughs> I can remember Katarina's stories, but I can't remember my own. <laughs> and I don't know why. <laughs> I have like a thousand oh. stories. Uh, I'm yeah, the queen of do. stories. <laughs> you have a thousand stories and they're all really, you have to do, and the best thing you can do in the world is to do a night shift with Katarina. A night shift with Katerina having uh, the hour break in that doctor's lounge, just, it's <laughs> yeah, amazing. So, yeah, it's so, amazing. So we, we have a lot of stories. Uh, I, I get too excited telling them. Yeah. yeah tell the nail yeah. stories. Tell the nail story. The, the, the nail story. I don't know. <laughs> Which one you're talking about? Oh yes, I know. So yeah, this was this is pretty memorable. This was a lady that came in with pain pain in her hand, uh, and this was like 3 a.m. and we were uh, uh, seeing her and trying to understand what was, what, what, what was happening. And she showed us her hand, and she basically had three necrotic fingers, and it was Burgers disease. But the the most amazing part was that she had perfect you know, gel nails on her necrotic fingers. And I was like, did your, the person that does your nails, didn't I never, you know, comment on the fact that your fingers were black? And she's like, oh no, I just, you know, just another day at the office. And this was insane to me how this person could have perfect, you know, amazing bedazzled hands with three necrotic fingers, uh, you know, it's just... <laughs> Another day in, you know, our ER, you know, another night. That was a great story. Can I go and do night shifts with you now, Anana? <laughs> Can you accept me? That was awesome. And I just have to say, Absolutely. like, Absolutely. Yeah, please take me. I love stories. I love her stories. And I just have to say, like, I, in Spanish, we would say, like, antes muerta que sentía Catarina. Like, of course she would have her nails done. Um, and, <laughs> Uh, just so that I can respect uh, other people's time and wrap this up, I really wanted uh, to put, to thank everybody 
And before we leave, I wanted to ask Katarina, she's been doing amazing job translating schemas to Portuguese and like she's been rocking that. Uh, it means so much to me to have uh, schemas in another language. And I just wanted to ask Katarina, um, what does it mean to you to like have, I don't know, I, I know that both of us are very language oriented people. Um, how has it felt to be working on Portuguese schemas for you? And I'll plug it in again. Um, you know, uh, before I started listening to the podcast, I found the schemas. Because, you know, when we're trying to study as a resident, you don't have a lot of time. So you want, you know, the, the highest yield knowledge, but in the most, you know, digested way possible. So I found the schemas and I actually downloaded the app before I started listening to the podcast. And they were so amazing. I was like, these people really know what they're doing. Um, but I also thought, you know, someone who doesn't speak English um, as proficiently as I do may have trouble accessing this information. So when I uh, started collaborating with the CP solvers uh, and I uh, saw that people were translating to Spanish, I thought, this is such a great idea, but it never came to me to translate to Portuguese. You know, that's, I don't know. I don't know why I never, uh, I never thought of that. But then uh, Danny and Laura were already on it and I joined the boat and it's been amazing because we get to study while, we'll tra while we translate and it's, um, it's great. Uh, seeing people reach out to us to help as well so if anyone who's listening today wants to help we need the help it's it's like almost 200 schemas and then in illness script so we need help but you know it, it's so rewarding thinking someone is going to read this thing that i'm translating that uh, i we didn't create we're just trans translating but translating is so important because it you know it, it makes uh, the schema go farther and this knowledge go farther um, and this is magical for me to see all these people here uh, and see the CP solvers enter uh, my residency program, program and I hope everyone else um, gets to uh, follow this as well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very magical because, you know, it just, it just feels so good knowing that more people are going to access this knowledge and this is going to make patients' lives better every day. So yeah, that's what keeps me going. And all of us, I think. Wow, Katarina, I love that so much. Um, you have been a dream to work with and you're taking the schema so far, so far all across the world. And we're extremely thankful for that. Uh, and yeah, uh, translating it has been a terrific job. We really hope that we can democratize uh, our tools in clinical reasoning and Katarina has been an amazing person uh, doing this. Um, I wanted to thank her especially, but also Luisa, Nuno, Ana, and Dr. Franza. Your residents are amazing. Thank you all for being here. And I can't wait for you to come back. Um, so happy Saturday, everybody. Happy Saturday. Bye. Bye, thank you for having us. Thank you, Lisa, it was our pleasure.